Good afternoon. Good afternoon. After two years of being turned around and not being able to attend, it's so joyful to be back here with you, Brennan. It's just you don't realize how much you miss something until you can't uh, can't attend for a couple times. Uh, I bring you the love of Grand Rapids. Not only did I bring you the love of Grand Rapids, but I brought Grand Rapids. <laughs> because a good number of our brethren are here today. Mankind's scriptural destiny of life in only three verses. This has sort of fascinated me throughout the years. I've been an elder for quite a few. Uh, and I always like these little condensed statements that the Bible would present and throw at us once in a while. And I'll give you an example of where I really got. I got interested in the truth. I was born into the truth family with because of my mother, but I never really made the truth my own until I married my lovely wife, Joanne. Then I decided I want to have the, the truth finish off that triangle. Joanne, the truth, that Joanne and my, myself here, and, and the Lord. But a man I worked with for several years was a devout Christian, but he was a, he was a Christian reform person. And one day, he and I, after I worked with him for two, three years, we got in a little discussion. We never discussed our beliefs, although he knew I was a Bible student. I knew he was Christian reform. But one day, our lady friend, our, our wives were out shopping. He and I were sitting there and we got talking and he brought up the fact that God and Jesus definitely were the same, the same uh, issue there. They were the same person. And I didn't know a whole lot by the, right then, but I did uh, come back at him and I said, you know, I always like the scripture, but I, I, I wonder what you think about it. Uh, when I quoted uh, uh, Genesis uh, 26, I believe it is, where God said, let us make man in our image and our character. And I said, I just wonder how you feel about that scripture. Uh, who is the doc, who is uh, that voice or who is talking to who there? Is there one creator there, or is there, is there more than one? And he looked at it, he looked at me, looked at it, and looks elsewhere, and he said, well, that's what we call a mystery. <laughs> and that fascinated me to the degree that I never left go of it. I always look for these little cl cliches throughout here, and the one that I'm going to talk on today is the same thing. I think if Christianity looked at this, these scriptures we're going to consider today, uh, they'd be amazed. I don't think they'd come up with any answers to them. I'd like to point out that most of the scriptures that we look at, we don't even question. We seem to understand them for some reason. Is this because we're better Bible students than most of the Christians out there? Or uh, are we just more intelligent than them? I, I, I think I can answer that for us. The answer is absolutely no. We, we read, we study out of the same Bibles, we read the same uh, scriptures, and we seem to have a totally different understanding of what the scriptures are saying, uh, then many of the Christians uh, come on to think what they're think what they're saying here. And I'd like to examine some of them. Where does this knowledge or where does this ability for us come from? Well, I think it comes from God. God decides who He's going to let understand these scriptures. For example, I like the scripture to start out with in Psalms twenty five fourteen. Uh, this is more, this is the Living Bible, more of a paraphrased version, but I love the wording. Friendship with God is reserved for those who reverence Him. With those alone, He shares the secrets of His promises. Then in Romans 1, 16 and 17, for in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed. And the righteousness that is by faith from the first to the last. And we find in Ephesians 1, 8 and 10, He has made known to us the mystery of His will according to His good pleasure, which He purposed in Christ. But today I'd like to bring focus upon just one set of scriptures that I feel the majority of Christianity, they're not going to be able to explain them very well. And that's the ones I alluded to a minute ago. But brethren, ever since I've been a deacon and an elder, it seems all of our studies, including the ones I prepared, and I'm sure the elders here might be able to confirm this, seem to be focused upon the activity of the brethren that have been called out by the Lord. Our walk with the Lord, our progress with the Lord, our help with the Lord. But not that many of our talks have been focused upon the brethren. 
uh, not the brother, the world of mankind. Uh, brother, uh, brother Keith this morning, or Kent uh, Humphreys, brought the population of mankind into focus at one time in his talk here. I believe it was 7.5 7, 7. billion people are alive today. Is that correct? 7.5 billion. And the, the number was also used that there's only about 8,000 Bible students alive today. Did I remember these things right? Amazing. Just amazing. Why do we look at these scriptures and we can condense them so easily and so much in harmony one with another for the plan of God. And there's so many, there's so many Christians, there's so many non-Christians out there in the world. The promises that God offers the world of mankind is actually unbelievable. And that's why I want to bring to you today these scriptures that we're going to get to in a minute and I'll read them and then we'll focus in on them. Now, we know that the Holy Spirit of God was poured out upon certain selected men of the Old and New Testament to record the information that God desired them to write. And once these scriptures were basically completed, these scriptures became, or these writings eventually became our Bible that we use today, including its translations. These men of old were evidently instructed by God to write in a compressed form without any uh, waste of words and so on. And I feel that the Bible was recorded in every dot and tittle that actually happened, plus all of God's pro prophecies for the future. I don't think anybody would ever want to read it or study it. It would be so large it would be unreadable almost. And if it were not in a condensed form, it's doubtful that millions of copies would have been printed and circulated each year as they have been. So I personally feel that I can say that the Bible is a very abbreviated and coded book. And it's difficult for a lot of casual readers to understand it. But again, I feel that it's also meant to be that way by God. There's a lot of individuals who say they enjoy reading. But I've noticed something. That a lot of times these individuals, they like to read a lot. They, you ask them what they read, they can tell you the title of the book, but they can't tell you what was in it. They don't remember. Sad though, in our life's lessons, uh, though, that these lessons that we have that we get through life are obtained through our eyes and through what we have heard and besides our exposure to uh, certain situations but people may go through these things but they have a lot of a lot of times they actually deny they don't want to learn certain things they like that don't harmonize with their own thinking well this really happened as well when Jesus first went to the Israelites as God's first call out once we know these stories well. You're going to hear a lot of repetitions of scriptures that you all know. You all know them well. You quoted them. You studied them. But when Jesus uh, went to Israel to present himself, the, they actually referred to re, they actually denied the fact that he was the Lord's the Savior that they were looking for. Romans 11, 7 and 8. What Israel sought so earnestly, it did not obtain, but the elect did. The others were hardened, as it is written. God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes so that they could not see, and ears so they could not hear to this very day. Brethren, I don't think we should have any question in our minds that God had definite reasons and objections, objectives that when he instructed these old men or faithful old men of, or men of old to record the Bible details, that he initially wanted them, the, the knowledge of these scriptures to be available to the call out ones first. That's why perhaps we understand them as simply as we do. He wanted the under the order to call out ones to have an opportunity to become members of the bride class for his son. And he also desired that these certain call out ones draw near to him voluntarily of their own accord as free moral agents. And once they recognized that they were included in the many that God called out, uh, he wasn't going to force any of them to respond to this invitation. But we do want to draw close, and that's why we're here today, brethren. We want to draw close to God. And James 4.8 instructs us to do so. When uh, the scripture reads, draw nigh to God first, then he'll draw nigh to you. 
As we, as we just mentioned, many are called, but not all will earn the privilege of becoming one of the chosen ones. This is worth studying a lot, because that's true. It's got to be true. There's going to be a lot. There isn't a number mentioned with the those that aren't chosen, but there's a large number, much larger than 144,000. We also know that the scriptures we have today are not just for us. It's called out ones, but they're going to, the same scriptures are going to be eventually used for the benefit of all mankind in the future. And I think, again, the scriptures were recorded for several other reasons. One of them just being that they're used to introduce God to us and all by just God himself. He, the God was identified here as the Alpha and Omega. Revelation scripturally records that. 22.13 I am the Alpha. I am the, and the Omega. I am the beginning and the end. The first and the last. And they also identify God as the source of love itself. They continue to relate him to all of creation as well, stating that after everything else was created, they show us how man was created and the moral characteristic of, uh, characteristic image of God himself. He was with the opportunity to live forever in a garden paradise. Then the scriptures show why death began and what was going to happen in the future because of what Adam did. And they also tell us that God originally desired voluntary obedience from Adam in the garden in order to, for him to receive full favor and companionship of his uh, fellowship. But we know that Adam, again, failed his commandments. And we're still living with the result of that disobedience today, brethren. Once again, if it were not for the recorded scriptures, mankind would have no idea now or in the future as to why they were dying. Man might realize by observing the heavens and the nature around him that there's a supreme creator. But again, without the scriptures, I don't think man would have nothing to confirm his observation that indeed there is a supreme creator. And at this time, I'd like to move ahead a little faster here, so I'd like to get a, a move down to a, a, just a thought. How many of you, we all have bought more novels, little books, and the big little books, to, Whatever, we want to read something casually besides the scriptures once in a while. And every time you pick up one of these books, you, hey, you can review what the book is about. In a condensed form, it's usually printed inside the front, front or back covers or behind both of them, but it briefly tells you what this story is about. And the Bible really is, brethren, uh, is no exception, I don't believe. It is, it is well, it has, it is a well of condensed overviews of God's hidden plans throughout the scriptures, such as we're going to be considering today, I, I feel. And I'd like to base my thoughts upon one of the areas that was through my introduction today, or the title of my thoughts, I recorded in only three scriptures long, which seemed to outline the entire plan of God for mankind here upon this earth. These scriptures are recorded, excuse me, the scriptures are recorded in just 43 condensed words in the New King James Version, but a little bit more, a little bit less than other versions. But I feel the Lord has instructed these words to be recorded as one of his hidden secrets or mysteries of the truth that we can find in the Bible. Now again, this relates back to the title of my discourse today about the whole destiny of mankind. In, the, in, these, in these few three, uh, just three scriptures, the scriptures are one of Psalms 104, 29 through 31. And we're going to read them and then we're going to discuss them. The scriptures read, you hide your face. They are troubled. You take away their breath. They die. They die and return to their dust. You send forth your spirit. And they are recreated, and you renew the face of the earth. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. There's a destiny of mankind for God. The 7.5 billion plus all the others that have lived and died on this earth. Let's consider the first verse. You hide your face. They are troubled. We know Adam's been mentioned a lot in our previous discourses today, brethren. And it's pretty obvious, if you study the, the life of Adam, he had, a, before uh, he was gifted with Eve, he had a close relationship with God. 
the scriptures allude very clearly that he and God they used to walk together in the garden. They were like father and son. I, I, I can't even comprehend. Brother Belko this morning said he, I can't quote where he said, but he touched on this thing of envisioning how people may have looked in the flesh and in their looks and their hair and so on. I can't even imagine in this situation how Adam actually walked and conversed with God. I wonder what they talked about. I wonder what they talked about, just the two of them. However, the time came when Adam was tested for the first time as to the conditions that God put upon him to stay in the garden and never have to die. We all know here that the result of that test and its effect it had on Adam and Eve, it had to have put a lot of shame and guilt on them, as described in Genesis 3, 8, that reads, And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God. Then because of their disobedience, God cast them out of this beautiful garden home and they slowly began to die. And you've now had to bring forth children in pain and sorrow that she evidently didn't have to do prior to that. Adam and Eve were also removed from the blessings of all their food that was available to them with little or no effort on their part, and now they were instructed that they had to go out and work and sweat, tilling the ground for continued survival. When someone who has once experienced the favor of the Lord, like almost being face to face with him, so to speak of, like Adam was, it has to be agonizing to, for him to then lose that favor. Throughout the centuries, though, brother, it follows that there were, there were others that had the same evidence, the, the same type of feeling that Adam evidently experienced. They felt, felt that anguish of God turning away from him. In fact, let's look at Job a minute. We have Job 13.24. We find him uttering, in, evidently, in, in a verbal prayer to God, God, why do you hide your face and regard me as an enemy? David evidently had these same types of experiences when he uh, was separated from God and he pleaded with God in Psalms 13.1 How long will you forget me, O Lord, forever? How long will you hide your face from me? So whatever these experiences were, these individuals were feeling God turning away from them. Isaiah, for example, when he considered the problems of Israel, he sadly said to God in Isaiah 64.7 Thou hast hid your face from us. And finally, brethren, when Jesus himself was on the cross, taking Adam's place in death, it was necessary that he too had to feel the agony of having God hide his face by withdrawing his presence, if even for a moment on the cross, when he cried out in pain, Matthew 27, 46, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But today, brethren, we're living in such a time of great trouble, God seems to have hidden his face or his presence from the entire world. Evil is still permitted to run rampant. Men don't understand why. And Miriam are crying out today, who is God? They're asking, why doesn't he do something? A lot of them are thinking he's dead, if not non-existent. The world's perplexed. They're troubled. Many are actually doubting the very existence, his very existence because they, he seems to have hidden his face from them. And I feel these, what I just described here, takes in the first verse of our theme text, our three theme scriptures today. Thou hidest thy face, they are troubled. Now we look over to verse, to the second verse, verse 29, which reads, You take away their breath, they die, they return to their dust. But before we consider that directly for what it's saying, let's first consider man's creation. In Genesis 2, 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. No, brethren, these scriptures don't say man was given a separate soul, but rather he was looked upon as a living soul or a living being. When God first created man, he designed the specifics of his human body, planned all of its functions to the smallest detail. We read that he formed the body of Adam using the dust of the ground. Brethren, there's no evolution here. The body of Adam was a direct creation of God, complete, perfect in every respect. 
But upon Adam's initial creation, his heart still did not beat to circulate the blood, which was already in his veins. His brain, his nervous system, they did not function because they lacked just one thing. They lacked oxygen, the breath of life. So then we read in Genesis that God breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life. He simply inflated his lungs with air, which is, a, which is necessary for any form of life on earth to live. And then suddenly, Adam's lungs began to breathe and his entire body now functioned totally on its own. His heart began to beat. His brain came awake. His eyes opened. And Adam became a living soul or being. This is how man's life started, brethren, by an inbreathing the breath of life directly from God. But now, let's consider 146.4 of how a man's life terminates. It reads, his breath goes forth, he returns to the earth, and that very, in that very day, his thoughts perish. So in other words, life's process is simply reversed. God gave man breath and he lived. God then takes away breath man's breath and he dies. His body returns to the dust condition from which it was taken. Ecclesiastes 12, 7 supports this fact as well. It reads, Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit, or breath of life, shall return to God who gave it. Let's remember, the spirit or breath represents the right to live. In support of this, Job 12.10 reads, In God's hand is the existence of every living thing and the breath of all mankind. Now, up to this point, the message of our text has been sad. The turning away of God's faith, of his face, first from Adam and then from the entire world. The deep trouble and distress that resulted from the permission of evil, the taking away of man's breath, the right to live, but brethren, we know, the world doesn't know yet, but we know it won't always be that way. Ezekiel 39, 29 reads, I will no longer hide my face from them. There is a promise from God. Now this brings us to a happy part of these theme texts, theme scriptures, which says, you send forth your spirit, they are recreated. I feel this part of our theme text has a twofold meaning, brethren. First of all, we know that God's Spirit is His power or influence. In the past, God set forth His Spirit on a lot of occasions for a lot of purposes. For example, we read in the account of the creation of the world of, in Genesis that the, which says, the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And when this happened, mighty forces were brought into play to shape and prepare the earth for man's habitation. God poured the same Spirit upon His holy prophets who were told in 2 Peter 1.21, they spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God came upon Joseph in Egypt, came upon Moses in Midian. It came upon Gideon. His Holy Spirit came upon Samson, came upon David and other faithful, worthy servants, inspiring them to do God's will. Then the Holy Spirit of God finally came upon John the Baptist, the last of the prophets. It drove John into the wilderness of Judea in fulfillment of the prophecy that was recorded many years previously in Isaiah 43, which says, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, saying, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. We know that men were looking for a Messiah long ago before Jesus was ever born on this earth. Prior to Jesus coming on the scene, John baptized thousands of Israelites for the remission of their sins. And it was John the Baptist who also hated of a new coming of the Holy Spirit that was different than anything else that's ever been experienced. And he said in Matthew 3.11, I indeed baptize you with the water into repentance. But he that will come after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to wear. He is going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Then Jesus came to John to be baptized, but not for the remission of sins, because he had done for him, the symbol of immersion in water had a different meaning. It symbolized the going down into death and then being raised into the newness of, the, of a new creature in the flesh. We read in Matthew 3.16, And Jesus, when he was baptized, he came up out of the water, the heavens were opened up to him. 
And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. Then three and a half years later, the human life of Jesus died on the cross. His new spiritual nature was raised from the grave three days later to soon be resurrected into heaven itself and rewarded with immortality. This was the fulfillment of Jesus dying as a perfect man, thus providing the full ransom that was required by God's perfect law for Adam's transgressions. Brethren, when we began our new spirit begotten life, as most of us here already have, we also become new creatures, just as Jesus did at his baptism. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things are passed away. All things will become new. And Paul said in Ephesians 4.23-24, we are renewed by the spirit of our minds, and you put on the new, the new man or new creature, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Also in Colossians 3, 9 and 10, we have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image that new image of him that created him. And now we move into our last verse, brethren, of the three verses. You send forth your spirit, they are created. I feel that those referred to here as they, as they has two applications. The first one is applied to members of the church, uh, Christ's bride, the body of the church. By the infusion of God's Holy Spirit, they're going to be raised as spirit beings, find themselves in the presence of Jesus in heaven. And we can add here that the scripture strongly suggests that those who do not make their calling and election sure are still going to be changed as well to spirit beings, as, but they will be before the throne as servants to the bride class. The continued pouring out of God's Holy Spirit will then bring all of mankind back to life in the resurrection where everyone will have new fleshly bodies without sin in their loins. And now let's consider the second part of verse 30 of our theme text. You will renew the face of the earth. What time do I have going to? And he renewed the face of the earth, as Peter expressed it in 2 Peter 3.13, Nevertheless, we, according to the promise, look for a new heaven and a new earth, wherein dwells righteousness. I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. And, that, and he sat upon the throne and said, Behold, I make all things new. This is where the reflection of, the, of this title of these thoughts came about, brethren. The 7.5 billion people that are out there right now that don't know any of these secrets or mysteries that God has laid before us are going to benefit from these promises. The, the, the prayer, the, the Lord's prayer, uh, may thy kingdom come, may thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What a blessing, what an opportunity, brother, to witness. What a promise to witness. Isaiah 35, 1 and 2 reads, The entire wilderness, the solitary place, will be glad, and the desert's going to rejoice as a blossom, as a blossom, in, as a rose. It shall blossom abundantly, and rejoice even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given unto it, the excellency of Carmel, Carmel and Sharon, and they shall see the glory of the Lord and the excellency of our Lord. This renewal of our earth will last forever. The nightmare of sin and death will be forgotten. And I think this, uh, this scripture, I'm going to read these scriptures, of Isaiah 65, 17 and 18, really sum this up beautifully. God's words, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered nor come into mind, but will be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. And this leads us to the final verse of our theme text, brethren. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. I don't think any explanation on my part or anyone's part is necessary. To, these words are self-explanatory. In summary, I hope that you, can, everybody can see that our theme scriptures are only three verses and 43 words can be applied in a condensed form to complete a summation of the entire plan that God has for mankind out there. On this earth, it shows man's fall into, into sin through a disobedience. It shows the loss of man's right to live forever on this earth, which affected the entire human family, 
that followed through the inheritance of this act or of disobedience. It shows man's redemption from death. It shows the restoration of the willing and obedient back to life. Then those remaining will be resurrected to life and fill the entire earth. And finally, we will find God rejoicing in his works forever. How thankful, brethren, how thankful we should be that all we consider today has been founded and guaranteed to mankind because of three major events that took place in history. Number one, we'll give to the birth of Jesus upon this earth in the flesh. And number two, we'll see the death of Jesus as a required ransom price that God needed for Adam's sin. And three, the resurrection of Jesus as the first fruits of those who had fallen asleep in death. Thank you, God. Thank you so much for revealing the meaning of your holy scriptures to us to help us prepare to stay faithful until our deaths take place. And then hopefully we'll receive our crowns of life and live for a reign with your son forever in heaven. May the Lord add his blessings. And brethren, I want to end my thoughts today. I used to enjoy writing poetry, little poetry, nothing serious. But I, I wrote a lot of poetry to a lot of brethren in our class over issues they were going through. I wrote a lot of poetry to my wife in the past. I seem to be able to express myself. That used to be. But I want to read you a poem I put together called The Bible. And we'll summarize with this poem. Many Bibles are bought, but all of them are not opened. Some bought them for help because they were weary and broken. While others bought them because of good intentions, but they never got serious enough to study them, always voicing new future projections. Some have questioned if the Bible was truly God's word or just a book. Many went more by what they heard than opening the pages for themselves to look. Many have bought Bibles only for others to see, rather than learn from them just what type of person they should be. Many Bibles that people have are actually quite old, but because they have never been used, look like they have never been sold. Our prayer is for those who want to know about God and his plan, that they accept the scriptures as his divine word and assemble by the direction of his hand. For within the pages of this book we learn of God's great love that he has for man by sending his son to die from heaven above, whom through we learn and understand why we must suffer and have to cope in order to receive the promise of everlasting life through hope. Thank you, God, for his most precious gift, the Bible. May the Lord add his blessings.